Welcome to Parenting Successful Teens, the podcast that cuts through the overwhelm and stress of this phase and offers parents simple, practical, cognitive, science-based strategies for keeping their teens on track. Join master coach and real-life mom, Allie Irwin, to talk about real teens, real problems, and the skills it takes to raise successful adults. Hello, everybody. Today, I want to talk to you about what motivates teenagers to do difficult work. And with teenagers, it can all feel like difficult work. You can ask them to unload the dishwasher (laughs) or fold a load of laundry, and they can act like that's difficult work. But today, we're specifically going to talk about difficult homework. We're Towards the end of September, we're far enough into the school year now where, you know, the workload has picked up summer vacation and like sort of that beginning of the year stuff is out of the way and the workload is picking up. And parents try all kinds of tactics in order to motivate their kids to do difficult homework. They try bribing them and nagging and yelling and taking the phone away and taking privileges away, telling them they can't go out with their friends until this work is done. And it kind of works. If you can figure out a kid's currency, you can get them to do things by taking that away. But that approach kind of sucks. (laughs) It sucks for you because then you're in the role of a nag. Like their homework in a way becomes your responsibility because you have taken on the role of nagging them to get them to do it. Or you take on the role of an enforcer. Like that's the same situation. Then you're enforcing the rule that they have to do their homework before they get the thing that they want. And in that way, their homework almost becomes like your responsibility. And while that works in the short term, it doesn't work in the long term because there always has to be an external enforcer. It sucks for you because it's not fun to do. And it sucks for them because they don't develop their own internal motivation. So in order to make this topic more fun, I want to tell you the stories of two of my student clients, Noah and Ashley, and they both very generously allowed me to share their stories with you and the work that we've done in the hopes that you can take this and help your teens develop their own internal motivation. So the first student is Noah, and when I asked him, what does your brain tell you when you are struggling with a difficult class? And Noah said, well, my brain says that I'm not going to be able to learn it, that I'm so dumb, and that I should have paid more attention when the professor was explaining it, and I'm going to fail the test. It's painful for me to even read that because Noah is an excellent student, (laughs) But it's pretty common for students, even good students, to tell me that their brain says something like that, that when they're confronted with difficult material, that their first reaction is for their brain to tell them that they are never going to be able to learn it, that they're too dumb to learn it, that somehow all the other students that have passed through that program have learned it, but they are going to be the one exception that is not going to be able to figure it out and that they're probably going to fail the test and then fail the class, and then, you know, waste thousands of dollars of their parents' money. It kind of goes from zero to 60 really fast. And Ashley said something very similar, but with like a slightly different twist. So Ashley said that her brain says, I'm a terrible student, and I like to be good at things right away. And so When I'm in a subject that I'm struggling with, I'm mad that I'm not already good at it. And then when they try to explain it to me, it's like I'm not even worried about how to do it. I'm just so frustrated that I don't already know how. And if you take together Noah and Ashley's comments, they perfectly describe what our brains are doing when they are running unchecked 
by the operating system that is our, as humans, motivational triad. So hopefully you're asking, what is the motivational triad? (laughs) And the short answer is it's the operating system that runs our human brains. It's like the very primitive parts of our brain. And it's based on the work of Dr. Douglas Lyle. And what he says is that the genetic code of successful species is basically written to do two things, to stay alive and reproduce. (laughs) And it makes sense, right? Like any species that isn't designed to stay alive and reproduce, like those genetic codes died out. And in order to get us to stay alive and reproduce, Our brain's operating system, the system that's been around since our caveman days, uses our feelings to motivate us to avoid pain, seek pleasure, and expend minimal effort. That's what makes up what Dr. Lyle calls the motivational triad. And if you think about it, like from a caveman you know, more primitive society sense, it makes sense, right? Like avoid pain, don't touch fire, don't eat poisonous berries, don't poke tigers. The people that did those things that avoided pain, they lived longer, they lived long enough to reproduce and the species went on. And similarly, seeking pleasure is eating things, drinking when you're thirsty, resting when you're tired and having sex when you have the opportunity to. And expending minimal effort, the idea there is we want to save our energy. We want to forage for the close berries because you might need that energy later to find something to eat or have someone to have sex with or to run away from that tiger you poked. (laughs) Well, those examples seem old timey and kind of over the top and crazy, If you think about the trends in our current culture, things like DoorDash, that is pleasure, food, with minimal effort. Netflix, pleasure, with minimal effort. The opioid epidemic, that's all about reducing pain and inducing pleasure, right? So our original operating system, the operating system that's responsible for our species making it, is still at play even in Noah and Ashley's stories. So let's let's take their stories again and see if you can see how that motivational triad is playing out in them avoiding the homework. So when Noah tells himself that he is a terrible student, that he's dumb, and that he's going to fail the test, he's creating pain with those thoughts. Now, his intention is to motivate himself with that pain to work harder. And we all do that, right? Like we think if we tell ourselves that we suck, that we'll be motivated to work harder. (laughs) But it doesn't actually work like that because we've tied the pain, right? The, The thought that we suck to the econ homework. And in our brain, because we're associating that pain with the econ homework, We want to get away from the econ homework, right? Like our natural instinct is to get away from things that cause us pain. And there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of inspirational memes out there on Instagram suggesting like no pain, no gain. Life begins at the end of your comfort zone. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. But for the most part, we humans do not want to do that. And we use willpower to overwhelm our natural instincts to get away from the pain. But our willpower exists in limited supply. Then some parents try and use the motivational triad by setting up a big reward system to increase pleasure. That's the idea of paying for grades or giving kids a privilege if they get a certain grade. Or we try to use the triad by increasing pain, right? That's what nagging is, is it's just creating external pain so that your external pain of nagging is bigger than the teen's 
internal pain of hating doing the work. It's hating being nagged more than you hate econ. With Ashley's answer, you'll notice that her objection that she hates doing things that she's not already good at is really just a version of not wanting to expend the effort to get good at it. Okay, that's a caveman part of her brain trying to conserve energy. And nothing has gone wrong here. Like in Noah and Ashley's answers, nothing has gone wrong. That is their brains operating exactly the way their brains were designed to operate. There's no reason for judgment. It's just an opportunity to teach Ashley and Noah how their brain works, like how that caveman primitive operating system works, and then how to get that same system online to be working for them instead of against them. It's an opportunity to teach them how to get the thinking part of their brain to manage the more primitive caveman parts of their brain. And when you do that, then you don't have to use the external systems of parents nagging and you don't have to use up all your willpower (laughs) just to get your econ homework done. Okay, so we don't want to fight our brains with willpower. We want to manage our brains. So how does that work? The good news is, if you've listened this far, you've already done the first step. And that is just awareness. Because understanding how our operating system works is a big help. Understanding that wanting to avoid doing homework that's difficult doesn't make you lazy. It's just your brain wanting to expend minimal effort means that you don't add judgment, the pain of judgment, to the pain of expending the effort, right? Like it's easier because you you still have to expend the effort, but you haven't added in the additional pain of judgment. So you're kind of working with one thing, not two things. That really leads us to the second step is when you're avoiding doing something, you have to ask yourself, what am I thinking? Because being able to ask yourself what you're thinking That is how you manage your brain. That is bringing the prefrontal cortex, the thinking part of your brain that's new, online to manage the primitive part of your brain that just wants to avoid pain, seek pleasure, and expend minimal effort. Okay, You you need to get your thinking part of your brain online to manage the primitive part. So you ask yourself what you're thinking, and if it's a painful thought like, I'm a terrible student, or I'm never going to learn this. You need to be ready to call BS on that thought. Neither of the students in this example are terrible students. Like, seriously, I cannot tell you in my five years of coaching how many students I've been on the phone with that have amazing grades, who've already done amazing things, like seriously. And then they get on the phone and they tell me that they're dumb. Like it's a fact. (laughs) And so the very first thing that I have to teach them to do, and I want you to teach your teens to do, is to call BS on those thoughts. And if the thought that you're thinking is, I'm never going to be able to learn it, one of those thoughts that have to do with how much effort it's going to take to do it. You Again, you just have to be ready to call BS on that. Of course, you're going to be able to learn it. Thousands of students a year learn this. You are not an exception. Your brain is just telling you a lie to conserve energy, and that's not a big deal. And so when this thought came up for Noah, we just made a list of all the ways he could get help if he needed it. Student tutors, professor office hours, YouTube videos, videos of the class itself, study groups, the list went on and on. And here's the really fun thing is most of the time when I make a list like that with students, they almost never need the extra help. What they need is to know that if their brain's telling them it's impossible, that they have a list of ways to make it possible. So we've reduced the pain with rooting out the painful thoughts. And we've noticed when our brain is telling us that it's too much work or that working hard is wrong or bad in some way. And we've not believe either one of those thoughts. And now is the fun part. Now we get to start adding pleasure in. 
And as humans, we are super motivated by pleasure. (laughs) And we can add pleasure to homework as well. And the trick is to add it to the process of doing homework and learning rather than to the result of the grade. Okay, because what we want to do is increase our desire to do the work it takes to get good at learning. We want to increase our desire by tying it to something pleasurable, right? Like right now, your teen is probably associating the struggle of learning something new with pain. And what you want to do is associate the struggle of learning something new with pleasure, So it's worthwhile to look at how your teen is studying and what would make it more enjoyable and productive. And (laughs) I have to warn you, they are not going to want to do this, right? Because if your teen hates studying, then thinking about something that they already hate is not going to feel like pleasure to them. It's going to feel like more pain. (laughs) They're not going to want to do it. If that's the case, then you can start with adding pleasure to finishing the homework. Noah and I made a list of all the rewards he could give himself when he was done. So in that way, it linked finishing the homework with pleasure. And having that link made it easier. Like once that link was strong and established, it made it easier for him to start because he knew he had pleasure at the end. I've done this dozens of times with students, and here are a few of the things that they've come up with, but really the important thing is for your teen to make the list for themselves, because one person put on there going for a run, and another person put on there taking a nap. (laughs) You know, like if you try to suggest the list for your child, like they have to figure it out what feels like a reward for themselves. So a couple of other things that my clients have come up with are 15, 20 minutes of guilt-free Instagram time. Like I said, going for a run, taking a nap, painting or drawing, indulging in a hobby that they really enjoy, hanging with a friend. And those things really tie to the idea that if you get your homework done more quickly instead of procrastinating, you actually create more time to do things that you enjoy. And so it links it in that way as well. And certainly the students that are taking naps and going for runs and hanging out with friends and having hobbies, those teens have lower stress. Adding all of those pleasurable activities in helps your students in dozens of other ways. Then if they have reduced resistance to thinking about their study process, then you can start to fiddle with other things that would make studying itself more pleasurable. And again, this is highly, highly individual. Some students, it's playing music. Some students find music distracting. Some students have had luck playing with different kinds of music. I have a student who figured out that she loved to study to piano covers of her favorite artists. So she couldn't listen to the artists themselves because that was distracting to her, but she could listen to piano covers. And if you have not listened to an Eminem piano cover, like it's pretty cool. I didn't come up with that. She came up with that because she was willing to play with the process of doing homework until she found something that made doing homework more fun. Some students love to study with other students. Some students love to study with a single study buddy. They find group studying too distracting. Some students even love using like colored pencils or colored pens. They find color coding their notes makes it easier for them to categorize and learn material. So some students study with a timer. Like they love setting the timer knowing that in a half an hour, they're going to get a break. They're going to get to like go on Instagram for a few minutes. So there's a myriad of ways. And what is really important is the idea of making doing homework itself, engaging with difficult material, that that in itself, you start linking pleasure to it. And that will increase your students' internal motivation. And then they'll have that internal motivation their whole lives. 
They won't need some they won't need you there nagging and threatening to take their phone away in order to get their work done. And that's just better for everyone. And with it in mind, I want to go back to my client, Ashley, and I asked her, what about the classes? Like you heard her answer for the classes that things were difficult. And I asked her, well, what about the classes that are easy to study for? And her answers were so spot on. And I want you to listen for the motivational triad in her answers. She said, the first thing that comes to mind is my environmental science class. I always do my homework in that because I want to impress my professor. I, oh, I want to impress my hot professor. <laughs> <laughs> then she went on with, well, I actually really like my English class too, because English like just comes easy for me. It's, it's natural. And I like Spanish because I love talking to the servers at my favorite Mexican restaurants. Like it's so fun for me to be able to order in Spanish. So you can hear there, I don't think I need to explain <laughs> the motivational triad part of impressing her hot professor. But in addition to that, she likes her English because it's expending minimal effort and the pleasure she gets from thinking that she's good at it, right? That's motivating in itself. And with Spanish, she mentioned the pleasure she gets from talking to the servers at her favorite Mexican restaurant. So that's both pleasure from food and pleasure from the social aspect of, you know, chatting with your servers and going out for dinner with your friends. So putting the motivational triad to work for us, to work for our students, works with our natural biology instead of against it. Instead of depending on willpower to overpower it. And that means that we develop a healthy relationship with motivation. We can use our thinking brain to make the hard stuff easier by not calling ourselves stupid or lazy <laughs> or telling ourselves that we'll never figure it out. And we can add pleasure into doing the work itself, not just into the accomplishment at the end, but add pleasure into doing the work. In teaching our teenagers how to put their brain to work for them and develop their own internal motivation is really the best gift we can give them. I hope this has been helpful. If you have any questions about how to put it into practice, don't hesitate to reach out to me at Allie at AllieIrwin.com. Have a great week, everyone. Thanks for listening to Parenting Successful Teens. If you enjoyed today's show, then I've got a treat for you. I have a free guide that teaches you how to get your teenagers to tell you about their day. No more one-word answers. <laughs> and grabbing this guide is super easy. Just text the phrase, get teens talking as all one word, no spaces, to the number 44222. So that's the phrase, get teens talking without any spaces to the number double four triple two. And then you'll be prompted to give the email address that you want the guide sent to. And then it shows up in your email box, just like magic. <laughs> you know what else is magic? Having teenagers that talk to you. Now, I can't promise that you're going to like everything they have to say, but I can promise better conversations. Grab the guide and I'll talk to you next week.